Welcome to Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. What if you could learn from experienced real estate investors, find out what got them to where they are now, get insight into their daily habits, and take these insights to inspire your own growth. Each week, Jonathan Green shares an in-depth look at the mindful approach to real estate investing. Jonathan is a lifelong real estate investor, advisor, and coach, as well as the founder and team leader of Streamlined Properties. Whether you're looking to start from scratch, get to the next level, or just for a straightforward and honest approach to real estate investing, Jonathan seeks to provide a free mentorship program you can take with you anywhere. Now, here's Jonathan. Are you in a logjam in your real estate investing business, can't figure out how to build those systems to scale up, and you're looking to flip? This is a great show for you. And even if those aren't your problems, they may be in the future. So it's time to listen up. My guest is Serena Norris. We're going to talk all about building those systems to scale in real estate investing. We're going to go through her history of great partnerships in real estate investing and flips and the Burr model. You're not going to want to miss it. If you're a consistent listener. I just have one ask of you. Please make sure to follow the podcast wherever you listen, because that way you'll get the episodes right when they come out on Mondays and Thursdays. Let's go. This is episode 129 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with my guest, Serena Norris. Serena is a house flipper, broker and realtor at Heaton Daynard. She is the head of marketing at Limitless Financial Freedom Expo, and she is the founder of Scale with Serena. She has flipped or bird more than 125 properties. Serena, welcome to the show. Hey, Jonathan. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you. Before we even get into the nuts and bolts of all of these burrs and flips, when was the first time that you remember being interested in real estate? So I was interested in real estate at a very young age. My father and stepfather and grandfather were all general contractors. Oh, so okay. I was definitely around remodeling a lot when I was little and was obsessed with floor plans and houses in general. Like I was that kid, that weird kid that would drive, ride on their bicycle everywhere around the neighborhood. And whenever there was a for sale sign, I'd go and get a flyer out of the, out yeah, of the box. That's the kind of weird I like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Um, sometimes I even walked into an open house and the brokers were like, why is the kid doing here? I'm like, my parents, yeah, so... <laughs> were you did did your love of the floor plan that part did you get into the sims when you were younger like this is what i want to do yeah. just building house yeah me too absolutely like i love the sims and i think i was obsessed with it more for like actually building the house than i was oh me too bored with the people i would let them go in the corner and pee themselves because i was building <laughs> like another room or like you know something else and then and then you know you you build the whole neighborhood and then you're like well that's boring let me just go build another neighborhood yeah, yeah. 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 So I, I grew up walking houses a lot from five years old on. Is that something that it was just always ingrained in you? But there had to be something that you really enjoyed about the aesthetic of houses, you know, just from a young age. What do you think that was? And then how did it translate all the way till now? Yeah. So like I said, my dad was a general contractor and he did high end remodels in the Magnolia area where I'm from. Um, I'm not from Magnolia, but I'm from the greater Seattle area. And so that's a nice area in in Seattle. And, and when I was young, I would visit him on his job sites and he would always ask me, Hey, what do you think we should do here? Like he was a very mm -hmm. creative person and he, and he ended up remodeling higher end homes that were very unique as well. And so they weren't cookie cutters. So he'd have to be creative and what they wanted to create. And they had a lot of liberty to do what he wanted with their houses. And so he'd ask me, you know, what I think, even if I was young and probably I said something, you know, completely ridiculous of what to do there. <laughs> but it still got me thinking about what I would do in that space. And then I would just create floor plans for fun. And then I'd show it to him. And then he'd tell me what was wrong with it. And then he'd tell me like the basics of, hey, you know, this is why you want the plumbing all on one side of the house. And here's, you know, and, and I started learning about, okay, you can't just put any, you can put anything where you want, but it costs a lot. <laughs> yeah. It costs like, it's going to cost more if you want to put it all the way over here. So I had a general understanding growing up about construction, but I ended up not going that path right away in my adult years. I went 
to college for something completely different. And then, but we all did found my way back. Yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting because your dad was really an anomaly because I think, of course, you've worked with so many other contractors now over the time. It's like a lot of contractors are really into the cookie cutter. Uh, I prefer that unique home because you have less buyers, but more obsessed buyers. Whereas, you know, McMansions work, they work, I guess everybody likes them, but they don't really have that, you know, wow factor of being a contractor where somebody says, Hey, do your thing. That's being an artist, right? And that's where, you know, the art of houses comes into it. My dad actually is an artist. Yeah, exactly. Right. That, that makes sense. I mean, my dad was too. And I, it's funny because this probably happened to you too. I realized like after I got, I was 18 and then around 20, when I started like actually doing more than just managing properties, I realized like, wow, he's told me a lot of stuff. I actually was listening. Right. <laughs> has, has that come across to you? You know, sometimes you're like, I don't know what he's saying. And then you get a little older and you're like, wait, I know a lot about houses. Yeah. Or when I was younger, I was like, oh, my parents don't know anything. And then now <laughs> when I ask some questions, they respond in the way like I know with construction, I go, oh, he does actually know a lot of yeah. things. <laughs> yeah, we, we never want to give them credit. And then I realized as a parent, now I'm like, wait, now I'm battling that exact fight. Okay, I'm going to get through this. So after you, you go to college for something else, when yeah. did you come back to real estate? And how did you know when, like, what time did you know that it's going to be the thing that you do? Yeah, so I ended up going to college for graphic design, branding and marketing down in LA. And I lived there for a few years. And I ended up when I was, by the time I was 20, I had a full jo- time job being an in-house graphic designer for a high end menswear company. And I just, over the, like the next few years, just realized that I wanted to work for myself. I got introduced to a lot of business people and entrepreneurs. And, and I just kind of realized like they're, they're just people. Like if they can do something, create something and, and be successful like that, then I can too. Um, and so I just decided at that point, like I, I didn't want to do freelance graphic design or start my own company doing that because I wanted to be able to leverage more than just my time for money. And I also, people, I don't think appreciate how much time it takes to actually create that kind of stuff. And I didn't want to have to argue my worth. I wanted to be like independent and and be in control of like my value. So I ended up not knowing what I wanted to do. So I moved from LA to Hawaii when I was 23 and lived out there for a year and a half, just like bartending, cocktail waitressing. At the time I had a friend out there that was kind of putting my ear, like house hacking, you know, buying a duplex and running out one side and living in the other and having to pay for your mortgage. And he was like, you have to read Rich Dad Poor Dad, read this book. And so I read that book. And then in addition, I was like obsessed with any sort of home remodeling show or flipping show or whatever. Yeah. And I just one day, it just, it just dawned on me like an epiphany of going, hold on. I'm trying to figure out like what other thing that I have an interest in my life, but it, I'm not thinking about something that I've always had an interest in and have a background in, and that's construction and houses. And then I can work for myself and then also build wealth. Right. And then I'm looking at like rich dad, poor dad's uh, ideology. And I, yeah. I was like, just on me. I was like, I'm going to flip houses and I'm going to acquire rentals. And then I'm, I'm just going to go from there. Right. Yeah. And, but at that point I didn't know, anyone in, I was planning on moving back to Western Washington, but I didn't know anyone in the area that did construction anymore. They'd either passed away or moved out of state. And so I didn't even know where to start. I didn't even know like a broker. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know anyone. Which seems world. silly. Cause there's like a jillion now, like you could just walk down the street and walk into three, just like a car pickup line. So. <laughs> right. And so I, then I was like, okay, I'll just get my real estate license online. I literally just Google. I was like, how do I get my real estate license? <laughs> oh, I can take the courses online. And so I did that, ended up getting licensed. And then when I moved back, within two days, I met my mentor at my cousin's wedding. Wow. And I just happened to be sitting across from the rehearsal dinner from him. He does ski patrol with my cousin. And he was talking, someone just asked him, which is kind of funny because he doesn't talk a lot about what he does typically yeah. to people that aren't in real estate. And, but someone asked him. And so he's like, yeah, I flip houses or whatever. And I was like, like what? Yeah. <laughs> and I was Wait, like, was that, was that James or Tarl? It was Tarl. I was like, yeah. at cool, at cool, at cool. And so by the end of the weekend, cause it was kind of like a destination wedding in the mountains. 
he was like, okay, I'm going to go. Like him and his wife, Grace, were going to go. And I said, hold on, hold on, wait a second. You know how you like said that you flip houses and everything like that? Okay, well, I'm going to work for you. So when can we meet next week? <laughs> yeah. It's funny though, because knowing Tarl, I can just see him because I can see, oh uh, yeah, I flip houses. And then it's like, how many? I don't know, like 600. Oh, you know, yeah. that's like James too. I, it's just like the volume is there. But it's really interesting that you you were so motivated to w- make it happen that it appeared. And I think that's what a lot of people, you know, who talk about who start going to meetups, you show up, you show up and you, you're you working at it. And then one day you read the purple book. And then next thing you know, you bump into someone because you're you're focused on making this thing happen. Did it, did it feel like, how did this happen? How did I end up next to this person who's flipped this many homes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you want to call it manifestation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, but at the same time, like I just took the opportunity and I ended up aligning with someone who you know, I'd work beside for nine years and, and continue to this day. So I just, yeah, I really like pinned him against the wall, really. And just at <laughs> that point, I mean, he was like, you know, I went home and I thought about it and actually like, I need help. And so I really landed in his lap as well. And then we became yeah. kind of like d- dynamic duo in a way for like, a, for a long time here in the Seattle area flipping. So it definitely benefited both of us. Yeah, well, in that partnership, did, what were the different roles that you played? Because I, I, I've had partners in flipping, and sometimes one's more on the aesthetic end, one's more on the acquisition end, or you you find this kind of balance on each project depending on like what the house looks like, where everything lands. Yeah, our roles evolved over time. Of course, there was a lot that I needed to learn. I had a, a decent understanding, I think, more than most for some reason I could walk in and just, and he'd ask me, Hey, much, how much do you think this would be in a rehab cost? And I was usually spot on by like 10 plus or minus 10,000. Well, so- it, it, you had the history of it. And then like, like we were saying, it, it kind of comes back to you. And then when you're studying it, it just goes, you can scale your mindset on how to do it much faster because you were walking around houses. You had a dad who was doing it. It just all comes back in there. It wasn't completely alien to me, even though right. I didn't know it's like something specific costs. Like, I was even, I, I don't know, I probably watched like hundreds of shows too. So even though HGTV isn't really reality, I could still get a sense of like, all right, it's probably going to cost this range or something like that. Anyways, so there was a lot for me to learn, even just how to manage contractors or terms and construction in a house and thing. And so eventually I started off as an assistant and eventually I managed all of the uh, construction management, interior design, and then I was the broker, like in-house broker for fixated real estate. And that was a yeah. company and I would do most of the disposition. And so I would say like where we differed in our roles was Tarl was definitely like a mentor and a teacher or a lot, but he, he doesn't really like the construction management part of it. Like we tried to hire a project manager so many times and just never worked out. So him and I ended up just having to do it, but I'm yeah. more of the aesthetic side. He's more of a, just get it done. But me having my marketing piece as well. And this is, I mean, flipping a house, that's really like a product. You're taking a product that needs work and Absolutely. It into a product that is desirable for the market. But how do we maximize our profit by the best product that we can with as a minimum expense? And so that is where I think working together with our, with our different skill sets ended up just we were really successful and the market helps in this area for sure. Yeah, yeah, that didn't hurt. But like you're car- you're carrying this affinity for aesthetics all the way through from childhood because I, I saw it the same way. I-, I went from liking to, you know, I was playing the Sims on building the houses like we were talking about. And then I, a- after I was a lawyer, I ended up in the art world for six years and everyone said, well, how is that going to help you with houses? I'm like, it's all about aesthetics. You yes. know, the way that I hang a house is the same way that I want the house to look perfect around the art and you're continuing even graphic design people don't get it it's like that's still an aesthetic principle how can i sell something with just the branding then you can take that to the house inside uh, and outside and and but what about the organizational side because that's one of your specialty systems and organization which i think is so so undervalued just because (laughs) contractors aren't usually great at that they need the help and once you get it you can 10x somebody else's business by helping them figure out the scale. So where did that part come from? Honestly, it it came from starting with 
very little systems and <laughs> we're being 25 houses at a time. So you can yeah. imagine like how busy, like when he's like, I need help. I dove in and was working like six and a half days a week, like 14 hour days. Yeah. So it's like, I don't Which is funny because he didn't think he needed help until he met you, but he has 25 flips going that he's trying to manage. That's yeah. uh, okay. And, and so, yeah, it was back in the day, like where the, it was before the market shifted, where he could rely a lot more, like general contractors didn't have as much work. So they could like manage a majority of the project. And then he just get the realtor involved. And then they would kind of do the quality control aesthetic piece. So he would just yeah. either, like, make sure it just moves along. And, and then it would get to a point where it'd be good enough to sell. When I came on, it was like, right then the market really started shifting where the contractors were like, give me a scope of work and a, you know, so it's something I can bid and, or I'm going to go to this job. Right. And they were no longer like willing to kind of project manage yeah. and the brokers also got busy too. So it ended up, we just became construction managers and with the increase in pricing with the construction, then we had to sub out more things and manage. It got to the point where we were managing probably about 70% of the scope of work. So if anything, yeah. I was acting as a GC. So in order to, I like keep our scale and my mind just went into like, what tools can we create? Like I, we were going like a lot of back and forth and it was just me a year later, we ended up adding a third team member and that's where things get really sticky because that's where information just, it's like becomes so disorganized. And so yeah. I started creating what I call centralized information tools. So very simple, like lists of our property addresses and lockbox codes. And then we ended up adding like the entity names to that. And then who was going to drive it that week and L and a filing system that was organized and started doing templates for scope of works, whatever, just trying to standardize and standardize as much as possible. I personally hate doing the same thing twice. Like if it's yeah. repetitive, I hate repetitive tasks. I want to be innovative, not like routine repetitive. And so Anytime that I found myself doing something over and over again, I was like, create a tool for that, create a template, right? Make create, a form, make yeah. a form, something like. Um, and so I kept missing things. All right, make a checklist for that, and eventually it just it became so systemized where it's just decreasing our time and time and time. We had a long, like, big evolution, but when it got to the point recently, a couple of years ago, because we're all moving, kind of going separate ways, because Tarla moved to Texas. At the end, there, of, like our partnership and construction management together, it was very systemized to the point where I think like I could only, I visited a property probably three times unless it was like a really, you know, finishing out a basement, waterproofing, like addition, something like that. Like I'd probably have to visit a bit more. We got so good at our planning phase at the beginning of the project and training our contractors uh, to, to our system, which they appreciated a ton. Yeah. And then really we just had boots on the ground boots on the ground for quality control and reporting back to us. And I could manage anywhere in the world. Like I spent months in South Africa if I wanted to, and I had seven or eight projects going on at a time up here. And uh, yeah, so system was key, honestly, to survive. If we didn't have them, we probably would have gone on long enough. We're not a, I always joke like James Daynard, I love him. He's one of my favorite people, but he's like such a workhorse. Like that guy like <laughs> used to work, man. And both Tarlin are like, we live to play. Like we want to go travel. Yeah. Like this is, this is supposed to be a vehicle. Like we looked at each other in t the end of 2017, 2017 was our hardest year for like a lot of reasons. And we just changed our whole buying model and like business models yeah. because if we have to this year again, it will never do it. Yeah. Because I, I think, you know, and I, I know from my conversations with Tara, like once you get the marketing piece going and you guys were buying a lot from James at the time. So there's a lot of deals coming in. You have access to as many deals as you want. And then you look and you're like, wait, we're at 40. Like we're insane. We, we have the systems, but 40 is a lot. We were <laughs> so buying, the overage. Yeah. We were buying anything that made sense, but then yeah. we realized that we didn't have the manpower, even with the systems. And we were trying to bring in a project manager, but that ended up like creating way more chaos. And, yeah. and we then realized that there's only in single family, there's only so much of the pie that you can split. And so we were just like, okay, let's just get smarter about the deals that we buy. Let's not just buy anything that makes sense. Yeah. Sit on the shelf. And then that's holding costs. Like it's cost money. It like doesn't make sense anymore. We, we want, we valued lifestyle as well. Right. And and so we decided, okay, what's our sweet spot? And we're like, we are literally going to do 
eight to 10 at a time. That's it. Yeah. We've done the end of the well, Still to some other people, that sounds insane. Right, right. <laughs> but, like, but that's down from 20s, you know. Yes, exactly. And that way, then we could have, you know, three of every, two or three of every sub, about two or three general contractors for about 30% of the scope of work. And then, and it was good. It was manageable. And we yeah. live life, right? And so, and we started keeping them as well as burying and um, everything. So, but the systems really, really helped. And I, the, what I want to touch on that too, is because it sounds like you understand how the graphic design might end up in, incorporating it. People don't see the connection to it. I know, but I know. Graphic design specifically with the amount of like computer programs that you do and the planning that you have to do with creating certain things, it's very, very process oriented. And so yeah. I actually attribute a lot of me being able to like create these systems and processes and understanding like what should go like the order of operations because of the graphic design, doing that over and over and over and over again and having to be creative. Yeah problem solve and, and stuff. And so even though it's very different from construction, it actually, in the way that my brain maps, it has helped for that. Well, I think like the way I'm thinking about it is graphic design. Like I said before, you're, you're trying to tell a story and you have to make sure that that brand's going to be able to be figured out, but also a little bit, you know, like hard. So people are more interested in it. And when you're renovating a house and you're figuring out house flow and where things are going to go, like this also has to be marketed. So it has to look good and it also has to flow nicely inside the house. And that's what you're just regular contractors who don't have designers and don't have those eyes. You go into those flips and you're like, well, this is stupid. <laughs> you yeah. know? Like, you know, the drawers that open up into the stove and you're like, how did you not know this was going to happen? And you guys have seen it a million times. And so have I, and I think that's where you end up making exactly what you said. You can go down to eight to 10 because you're making quality choices on better properties with bigger scale, which is where I figured like there was a time when it was easy to flip for like a $50,000 profit, but my market has high price points. And now it's interesting, the higher price that I buy in on the more scale I can get. So as long as I can buy it, I'm going to make more money. So it's gone from 300 was an easy buy, you make 60, you spend 60. But now if you buy at 550, the last one, it was 180 reno and 200 profit. So if you go to 750, you can maybe profit 300. But then like you said, you're making the choice to not do those little ones. Sure, the deal's good, but let somebody else do it because it's going to clog up making a better product for the best ones. Yeah. What's interesting is, is in our evolution, we, we actually did the opposite because we had systemized things so much. And we also got more knowledgeable about construction. Naturally in the first few years, we ended up going higher and higher end. But what we found in this market is the buyer expectation and the Ex how expensive construction and contractors were in that higher yeah. end. It ended up where we had to sub out every little thing on the, on the job and it really messed up our systems and it took a lot of our management. We had to be yeah. in the Seattle area. We could no longer travel as much and we, we had to micromanage a lot more. And so Tarla and I actually decided that we were going to go back to like the lower mid range and essentially just plug those in the systems and just press go instead. Yeah. And so that worked out better for us. But I think it's different in every market and also different of like how you want to spend your time and how you want to manage things. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you, you guys had access to deal flow. And that's something that a lot of people don't have. Like if you're just trying to shop on the MLS as a baby flipper, you're just you're not going to be able you're choosing one out of, you know, a couple and you're not going to win. At least you guys knew that you could get the properties that you wanted. So you could line up this this approach to say like, hey, well, these are going to be easier. Like you said, the people who are buying these are going to be a little less crazy, you know, about one, you know, little tick in the marble there because the price point is going to be compressed to a level where they're going to be happy that it even looks like that. Yeah. Yeah. And like the fact that in our price range too, a lot of the flippers, like you said, were just super generic and not, yeah. <laughs> you'd walk in and like the light bulbs are all different colors and like all. Yeah, I know. Right? And to me, that drives me crazy. I'm like, I, so want, crazy. I want a soft white in every single bulb. Right. And like, they don't understand, like contractors look at me like I'm crazy. And I'm like, you don't understand a buyer walks in and it feels like home or it feels like more homey or feel, they don't know what makes them feel different, yeah, but yeah. they feel different. And they want to write an offer on that property instead of this. Property. I completely agree. Hey, 
it's Jonathan. This is just a brief interlude to talk to you about Deal Machine. Listen, I've used Deal Machine and I was crushing it with my Concerned Citizen postcard on Deal Machine. You can look that video up on my YouTube and find out how I did it. It works. Deal Machine works. I've had David Lecko, the CEO, on the podcast. So if you want a free trial of Deal Machine, the elite driving for dollars app, and I'm telling you, it works if you use it correctly, you can go to my link at bit.ly slash zen deal machine. Now, bit.ly is B-I-T dot L-Y slash zen deal machine. It's free and you'll be up and running in two minutes and then you can figure out if you want to keep it. Let's get back to the show. One of my pet peeves, I want to see what you think, because I have a lot of them when it comes to flipping. It's like, you know, when you go in and you're like, oh, like this bathroom tile is nice. And then you go upstairs and it's like the same bathroom tile. And then you go and it's like the kitchen backsplash. And you're like, okay, you bought in bulk and and you went too much. Like, relax. Like everything I like to be different. I love walking into a bathroom and then like a like a small powder room is is wallpapered. That to me is like such a surprise. And it's something that, you know, contractors aren't going to think about. They're yeah. not designers. They're like anti-designers. They're like, hey, let me just make another accent wall. That's what's very popular here for just contractor based is like you can't get enough accent walls. And you're like, I don't think people want four different accent walls in four <laughs> rooms. That's a, it's a little bit much like they read Contractor Magazine. Sorry to all the contractors, but you know, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> So organizationally, though, where do you think flippers in general, from all the people that you've talked to in your own experience, where do you think flippers go wrong the most now, organizationally, and then also on the design side? So I consult with a lot of flippers now. I kind of fell into that, like just through doing podcasts and stuff. I get calls all the time. Help. I need to systemize my business. Or, hey, I just bought my first flip. I need hand holding. I don't know what to do. Right. Yeah. And so I would say that trying to think one that that applies to all of them is I think they're not consciously thinking about systems they could create. Like they're already processing a lot during all of the flip. But even from the first flip, going back and analyzing, hey, what processes did I take and how could I make that better? Yeah. And even from the first flip, the first flip could tell you so much. You're sort learning. I feel like a lot of people write off their first flip and they just go, well, that was an absolute shit show. And I'm just never going to think about that again. And it's like, hold on a yeah. second. You learn so much from that and your second flip. Right. Your flip. Yeah. Take the lessons. That's what they're yeah. there for. You, you, you know, you're going to, because, or else you, you're right. Those people who don't take those lessons, they go to the next flip and they do the same thing. And you're yeah. like, we just, we just told you, you just didn't look at it. That's a really good point. The other thing is that they don't start documenting from day one. So, and what I mean by documenting is like, okay, you create a scope of work for your first flip. That is the beginning of a template. That is the beginning of a system right there. Because what we did is we, oh my gosh, in the beginning, we literally wrote scope of works on Word documents. They were like two pages <laughs> long. And yeah. now our template is like 450 line item pieces, right? right? Yeah. In, a, in an Excel and we use smart sheets. But um, I just found myself creating a scope of work for each project. And I was like, hold on a second. Not only one is this repetitive, but two, I'm surely going to miss something if I'm here just like dreaming up what the scope of work should be. So what we realized is that let's work off of a scope of work we've created. Think about it. Is there a way that this could better be organized the next time? Reorganize it then add to it. And we ended up over time creating this massive scope of our template of anything we could ever do on a property with already like generic written description of verbiage for that. So like, for example, like a lot of times in the beginning, you just, our scope of work, we just put, you know, drywall repairs. Well, how generic is that? I mean, you get a bad contractor and he'll argue you up on the table. It was just over here, not over here, or that kind of repair. So like you have to have something descriptive, right? To save your butt. This is contractual work. So we would put generic stuff in there, you know, but we can go in and change it anytime. But we ended up with this massive list. We go, we'll just delete what we don't need. So when we start a project, we take that, we delete what we don't need, type in the unique details. And then there you go. We've got it. And it took our 
the creation of a scope of work time down the at like to like an hour versus hours yeah. and you're missing anything. I can't tell you the first few years how many times I missed a freaking dryer vent install. Like yeah. till our <laughs> fire repair like <laughs> request right. came back. But that that that's a great point because what you're saying about the scope of work and having a full punch list to start with is the thing that will save you on inspections because the worst part is when you do a really good flip and then you do something like you miss a dryer vent and then that buyer is thinking like, well, what else did they miss? You know, is the water hook up to the fridge there? And yeah. then they get into this mindset where they could just go into a rabbit hole when it was like, oh, we just missed a dryer vent. Like everything else is perfect. I've done this on my own flips and you get the questions and you're like, you know, why did I do this? You know, Absolutely. why didn't they just vent the bathroom out the top? I told them to do it. You know, it wasn't out the roof. It was going into the attic. That happens here all the time. And you know, you're going to get it. But I think that people forget. And especially if, if they're the sub, you know, they're working for you, you're the flipper, they're the contractor, and they don't have a stake in the outcome. They're not thinking like, hey, there's going to be a lot of people looking at this at an open house, and we're trying to get the most money, we want to get multiple bids, like, they have to understand that that's the goal. Because this, this is a great thing to get your take on. So the thing that is like one of my biggest pet peeves is when you get to the end of a flip, and then the contractor, you know, they have an, a next job. So they go to the next job when it's like 94.5% done because that last 5.5 isn't like a whole crew day. So you end up with this product that you kind of like are stuck almost listening with the punch list left because it's not worth their time, but then it doesn't look as good. And then people think something wrong. Have you seen that on your own projects? And then is that part of what you helped get corrected with these sheets? Because they would definitely help. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing too is having that initial walkthrough with the with the contractor or initial like, you know, it, once we did so many houses with us with the same contractor, I, I wouldn't really w need to walk it with him unless it was a unique property. Yeah, I'm doing the bid request. I'll say something like, "Hey, this one is like a higher end. Like we, it's it's a higher price point. It needs to be like just emphasizing like the level of quality it needs to be. Or it goes when I'm walking punch list with them. I'm like, they're like okay, we'll let this one go. And here's why this is because it's a lower price point, but for the next project, it needs to be perfect. So like getting training them and having that dialogue with them. So they understand like, Oh, you're trying to market it to people, right? right. That goes back to the design, the original aesthetics of design though, really. I don't think they realize that because they're, because again, they're, they're working a job for you, but if they understand the concept, then it's like, you can't leave you know, one outlet cover off, they're going to think everything's wrong. <laughs> like buyers are crazy. I would be like that though. I'm like that as a buyer, you know, I see one thing wrong and I'm like, I wonder what's behind the walls. It's a, it's fair. Yeah. Well, the other thing we'll call them back. If there's repairs that were requested that came in, a lot of times at the end, we, we ended up doing like a home inspection report right before listing. So that yeah, way me too. Uh, great I idea. Think, but I would, I would send it to the contractor and add it to their punch list. And so they started realizing like, oh shit, if I don't do it right, like I'm going to I'm gonna have to come back. Yeah. And so, but, so I had that conversation with them. I go, we like, this is why it's so important to train you guys and, and do it right the first time. Cause it's going to end up costing you more money and labor, not doing it right. And so they would figure it out and like, okay, let's, let's prep for paint better. Right. Like this is for yeah. example. You can paint walls all day without tape, but it's going to take you twice as long, right? Without yeah. then you have to repaint yeah. all the trim. Exactly. So it's like, you know, or like go with a bunch of, I'm like, okay, just do all the prep, do it right. And then it'll end up saving you money. And eventually I've seen contractors, they grasp that and they go, okay. And then they also get an idea of my expectations. So always with the first time I'm using a contractor, like our GC typically did a lot of the stuff at the end. So I do my punch list with them and it would just be blue tape all over the freaking house yeah. the first yeah. time. And they'd look at me like I'm crazy. And I'm like, okay, well just know that as we work together, it'll get less and less because you will know, you will see your guys's work and correct it before I come and correct it. And they go, okay, that's fair. Right. Yeah, and But that, that's what annoys me the most. Cause it's like, you, you know, if you, if there's a scuff mark here, like I can't have a scuff mark, we're trying to sell it. it it's like, they, there's just like a disconnect there and you do have to do it multiple times because it's very difficult. I want to go back to one point you made, cause I think it's so great. I don't want people to, to miss it. And me as a, a licensed agent too, for 10 years, run a big team. The pre-inspection is so important. I think people think like, hey, well, it's a flip or it's a new build. You don't need to do an inspection. Uh, you do. 
Because then you can take the whole report and say, here's 80 pages on everything that's not done. All of this needs to be done because when we go to sell, this is what the buyer is going to get. And this looks like it's a lot, even though it's ticky tack. You yeah. need to fix the ticky tack before the buyers get to it. So that then there's no requests, hopefully, other than, you know, random stuff. But that that can save you so much time, money and save you losing a buyer, because then if you do lose a buyer because of something kind of major that somebody forgot, then it looks like the house is worse than it is because then you're back on market. These are just things that go well beyond what a contractor knows. But I think if they understood the process better and you you could all be on the same page, like this is a presentation, like going back to the design center, we have to market this. It has to look great on Zillow, but it also has to back up the photos in person. We can't have it look weird in person because you didn't finish something. Absolutely. And it's such a great learning opportunity as well, because then you understand more and more what different home inspectors are going to call out yeah. um, and the verbiage that they use too. So then that way you can use those remarks even and to refine your scope of work budget exactly. and template to then have the wording. So then the contractors have a finer instructions of, of what to do. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a learning, it can be a learning process with the contractor and you, not just with the home inspectors, but also like permit inspectors, oh, God. You know, right? Like with the, with the home inspections and the worst. Yeah. You know, and, and they don't always agree, but the thing is, it's no. not about like, okay, what agree? Like what's going to be get our permit passed. Okay. Like, exactly. We're going to yeah. fight the metal excusians. Okay. Like we can be here all day, but I just need them plastic. So we get this signed off. Like it's so dumb, yeah. <laughs> but, um, and that's where like building the relationship with the contractor too. Like we all want the same thing here. And you know, this is a business to us as much as it is for you. And so the better that we do, then the more houses we can have for you. And, and the contractors, if they were on board, man, they loved working with us because they just yeah. knew that they were going to get house after the other. And it was going to be, it was going to come with a detailed scope of work, floor plans, a design package, with yeah. so tra having to track down design information all of the time and paint colors and tile and all that kind of stuff. We had, we purchased a lot of the like fixtures and materials ourselves and just had them to pick it up. And so they didn't yeah. have to source all that stuff. Like, we got it down to like make their life easier so they could maximize their effectiveness and efficiency. And then we could effectively control the quality of the job. Yeah. And yeah. So yeah, they love working with us anyway. So there's always going to be like little hiccups. But yeah. But you, you said before, I think what's really important is you, you want to send them to the next job when it's complete because your, your, your pitch to them is, Hey, you won't have to come back if you do it right the first time. If not, you're going to be in the middle of a new job and then you're gonna have to come back here and do this for a day or a day and a half. And it's not going to be the stuff you want to do. So how about just do it right the first time? You know, that 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 should resonate with them because you're trying to make more efficient. But it is tough because there's so many moving parts. Like you said, if you're using a contractor and they're using the subs, we use our own subs. You guys use your own subs. So you have to do multiple managements to make sure. And then sometimes the subs don't like each other. And you're like, well, I mean, can you guys just be adults and like, oh, we can't be there on the same day, the plumber and the electrician. You're like, this is like high school again. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather play The Sims and just let it let it go. Yeah, no, one hundred percent. You're spot on with that. Yeah, we used to sub out most of our rough end, but luckily, like over time, you can um, the subs. I feel like there's sometimes always a disconnect on certain things. Like who who hooks up the the power to the hot water tank? Well, it's a hot yeah. water. Tank. It should be the plumber. It's like no, it's electrical. It should be the electrician. I'm like, can one of y'all just like put the wire in the freaking hole and connect? Like, I don't yeah, know. right. So, but once you're set, once you have, I mean, I had a team, a large team and going like back to your point of like, you know, how do you like with the organizational piece and how did you learn all of that? It, it, it's there, a lot of times I get asked, like, how are you qualified for that? How are you qualified for going into a small, medium sized businesses and, and helping them with organizational development? I go and leadership and, and and structuring. I'm like, okay, well, you do understand that even though our team was about like four or five internally, probably had like 30 subcontractors yeah. and general contractors I had to manage uh, throughout like all of our jobs. And those are people that have external businesses. They have their right. own systems and processes. They have their own values. They have their own like ways of doing things. And I had to figure out like the common denominator to everyone work in, seamlessly in that ecosystem right yeah. and, to, and to empower them like give them the information lead them give them the objectives clear vision of what we're going to do and then empower them to be able to like lead themselves 
in the way of like what, how we were going to be happy with the finished product. And so, yeah. so as a flipper, like, no, like you're not just a one man team, like the contractors that you hire, they are your team. And so a lot of times when you walk with contractors, the first time on the job, it's yes, you're interviewing them and like, and, and saying, Hey, here's the scope of work. Here's what you need to you need from uh estimate I need from you, but also like pausing and saying, Hey, I want to let you know, like what my goals are. And like, I'm not just an investor flipping this one house. Like I want to do 10 this year. And yeah. so I'm looking to build a relationship with an electrician that I can give all of my jobs to. And with that exchange is, you know, flexibility in your schedule, decent pricing, not like every little thing, like valuing that relationship. And I'm going to try my best to make things as easy as possible for you and want to build that relationship. Is that something that you are open to? And some guys are like, no, nah, I'd rather just take the residential prices yeah. and we can go separate ways. And then there's others that were like, hell yeah, that sounds awesome. I just want to know where to send my guys every day. So yeah, I, I feel like I've had the experience where it works for a little while, but at some point, if they're still running another business, they start to like, I, I've been charged more after six jobs. And I'm like, don't you know how this works? You're supposed to go down in price. I'm feeding you the stuff. Like, you know, it's just like a, it's a bad business mindset, like you said, and they're disorganized and then they take it back on you or you can tell they're moving, you know, materials from one job to the other. You're like, I didn't need that much drywall. <laughs> you know, and those are things that you catch when you have a system that you probably couldn't catch before. If you're running eight jobs, of course, it's great if they're all yours, but they might be running other jobs and then there's some missing parts in there. Yeah. And I think that comes down to the materials. We only purchase materials that we really wanted to manage. Like, we very rarely on the houses would buy like the drywall and the doors and the millwork and all the stuff that we, they could just walk away and all, or, I, I don't know, there couldn't be an audit there, but like yeah. kind of in control of like tile and pictures and aesthetics, everything that's aesthetic was, yeah, exactly. Right. Um, there's some things that were like, okay, three plumbing fixtures, go pick it up from Home Depot. They're like never out of stock, but lighting somehow is always out of stock. So we would, yeah. that. So you just kind of yeah. learn what works, but, um, but yeah, we, we wanted to, the more you learn about construction through this, the more that you end up like taking on, but the more that you take on the construction, the more costs that you eat, the more waste that you eat. Yeah. So we still liked to keep that separation of, okay, here's what we agreed to. And if they messed up on the estimating of the, the materials and everything like that, of course, if like they budgeted the doors at like 200 door and then the, the doors we wanted ended up going $60 up in price, like we'll work with them on that, but it yeah. like they'll eat that cost. And so what I wanted to note too, about the documentation from day one is with that scope of work template, I started writing out all of the pricing for each line item. So I not only could effectively and accurately estimate what my budget was going to be all the way at, at underwriting, right? Yeah. So we could get like as sure as we could about saying yes or no on a, on a project. But I also could, I also could track if my contractors were creeping in price and yeah. being able to have that conversation with them and being like, Hey, this house is very similar to the last house. And why is it two grand more? And they can say, Oh, the price, like the price of this material went up or this, or I, and, and, or negotiate and say, honest, like, it's not that long ago. Like, can you come down a little bit? And then, so yeah, you can negotiate, yeah. but you can't negotiate unless you have some sort of reference point. And so start documenting what that is. And then, you know, last thing about that scope of work budget template is, the cool thing about making it in a way that like makes sense to the contractor, like having it till is I would just export that into an Excel, send it to my general contractor and wherever I had GC on a line item, I'd have him bid it. And so then it, I'd have him bid it right on it. So it saved him a ton yeah. of time. He loved it. He's like, I don't have to write up a whole estimate with all the, the details and stuff. Saving him a ton of time. I just type in the quantities and, and, they, yeah, and they know how much it costs if they can look across and know that it's there it's much easier for them to just do that instead of saying like well now i have to write up like you said that's like the bane of their existence to have to do it 
at when they're just getting home at 9 p.m. and they want to hang out with their kids. Or yeah, something. you always ask for like, oh, can you bid this out? And it's like six weeks out. You're like, we were supposed yeah. to start three weeks ago. I'm not sure what happened. I don't even have a scope of work at all. Yeah, I send them a scope of work that's detailed. They they fit, fill in what that price is going to be on line item. And then I can take that back to my budget, my this template that I have that has all of the, the budget. And then I'm comparing apples to apples. And yeah. then if we do a ton of properties together, I can just pull out this the contract from the last job and compare apples to apples. And so I can see, okay, last job he charged me this for a toilet. I have this budgeted and now he wants to charge me this. And then I start seeing the story. And that's when I, that's when you become powerful in your negotiation with them. And and if they're just not willing to work with you at all, then you're like, okay, writing's on the wall. No 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 longer becomes ambiguous yeah on the price creep and also like is this person is it all in my head that they are like charging me more and not working yeah with me? yeah so. i think it also goes to like once you understand everything in there like you said you have much more leverage as somebody who's running the jobs because i would say for like brand new flippers you couldn't implement the system right away because you you may be able to like copy and use a template but if you don't know all of the line items you, you don't really have any leverage into negotiate. Somebody says, well, that's 2,600. What's your answer? You know, I mean, if you don't know what each line item costs, and that's why the repeat is important. You realize, oh, from one to two, actually, those prices did go up. That makes sense. If you don't know, a first flip is really hard. So like right now, if somebody came to you and said, I've never done a flip. Should I be flipping right now? We're recording in the last day of February of 2024. I always think flipping's hard for first timers, but I really think people with design sense do better. What's your take on should someone be flipping right now? I mean, of course, it's price point dependent. Assume they're buying a pretty decent deal, but we all know this could go haywire. So your best defense is just get multiple, multiple bids, right? So, and also reaching out to a network. If you don't have a good network, go to meetups, start. Yeah, absolutely. The best contractors we ever get, we're, we're all through either word of mouth, like referrals, people that, you know, we tr- know just gave them their contact. So they, can, and, but getting multiple bids, asking for line item bids. And so then you can understand how they're breaking things down and then compare, you know, don't ever just take the first bid. Yeah. You have to, under, and even if it takes you a little bit longer, like don't get down if this first flip takes you like six or seven months, like understand that it's you need to know when to say yes, how to say yes or no. And you don't know how to make a decision yet. So you need to, you need to get uh, multiple data to order to make an informed decision. And from there, start putting that into some sort of spreadsheet to start recording that from day one, you know, just like, okay, drywall installation, here's materials, here's labor. Okay. That's information that's going to help you down the road. And so say yes or no on a flip. So dependent on the area, I'd say I would, if you're flipping a house for the, for the first time, definitely try to have like some more margin in there or definitely say, okay, it's going to take me seven months to flip this thing. Even if it's like yeah. you think it before, you know, exactly. like it, it's going to take a few more months than, than expected. So make sure that you are computing uh, extra holding costs in your PL. And I just say, honestly, construction's not scary. It's like, it's a lot of details that add up to a big thing, but break it down into, um, into different pieces and yeah, line item bids, get multiple yeah. of them. Well, I think then like, say you get three bids on all the line items and it, you, you kind of have an average of what maybe it should cost. So that gives you leverage for the next project to keep going. Like you said, the most important thing is to document all of those things and organize them into something that you can look back on. Because if you just keep them, you know, in a paper, or you scan them, you're gonna have to go back through, which again, is going to be a waste of time. So I mean, I think people can see the organization. It's just very hard to do. But like you said, once you did it, and you did all the work to systematize when you're doing 20 flips at a time. Now you're saving yourself dramatically, not just on the next one, but over like the next 20. And then all that time can be put back into doing better things to find better properties or upgrade other parts of the business that wasn't available before. Absolutely. And if they, you know, if someone's listening to this and they are novice flipper, they haven't done a property yet, or they're scared to do another one because the first one didn't turn out, I would say network, See if you can find a mentor too, where you're yeah. like, hey, I'll bring the deal 
and I'll figure out the money or maybe they help get money too. And they get like a higher percentage of equity being like, will you just consult me on the operation, right? On the operating part of it, like the actual management of the construction and just overseeing that I'm doing things correctly. Or if I have a question about, Hey, this contractor is bidding out this way. Is this right? Or something like, can I, can I rely on you? And, and yeah, you'll give a chunk of your, your profit away from that, or maybe, you know, pay them just a fee or something, but at least then it'll you'll be have well worth it. Yeah. Win, be worth it. Like have some framework to work off and just a, a sounding board as well. Some sort of direction. So yeah, I've been, I've been helping a, a flipper in Washington, DC. I met him like a year and a half ago at a bigger pockets conference and he remembered me and bought his first flip about four months ago and was like, Hey, Serena, I don't know if you remember me, but I just bought my first flip and like, I need some handheld. I need help. I don't even know if you like consult on this or coach on this or whatever, but like, can I hire you? And I was like, well, I'm consulting for like organizational. Okay. Yeah, sure. Like I'll, I'll, help, I'll help you. And now we're on a second flip with him. And it was so, so cool. I was actually in DC and was able to like walk through with him and like meet him with his architect and stuff. And oh, so, that's awesome. You know, like people that have been in your shoes before, you, like they definitely are open to help, like helping you in some way. And as long as you're ambitious and they're not just going to like expect them to do everything for you. Like if yeah. you're ambitious, if you're a go-getter, if they're like, Hey, go out and get three bids and you go out and get three bids and bring it back. Then they're like, okay, I have an interest in, in they're serious. Can you grow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. Awesome. Serena, where is the best place for people to get in touch with you? Is it Instagram? Yes, probably Instagram. And then from there, they can also link to if they want to do like a consulting call. with me. Yeah. So that's Serena.Claire on Instagram. And then they can book the call in the link tree for Scale with Serena, right? Absolutely. Awesome. One more thing before we get off, because I've noticed this about you. A ton of your closest friends are all real estate investors as well. Yeah. How important has that been on the journey? Because we've talked about it a little in terms of like the relationships, but like I know lots of your closest friends and then I remember seeing it all just from social. And it's like, this is really a big thing that I think people don't get. It's that these relationships become lifelong friendships, JV partners, business partners, but they really change the whole trajectory of your life that you can't just do it on your own. Absolutely. I mean, I probably go to four or five conferences a year and you never know who you're going to meet. Like I just, just said, like the connection that you make, you never know. Like I've met new mentors, right. Just by going to masterminds and workshops and conferences. And it's so important to get out there and it doesn't matter like what stage you are in your real estate journey or entrepreneurship journey. Just go out and meet people and just be yourself be authentic and genuine and man i just love the bigger pockets community and 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 everyone i was just so fortunate to meet those great people in a mastermind about four or five years ago and we just yeah. created such a great family so yeah get connected it can be a lonely lonely journey being just on your own and so get connected go to events yeah, you'll make way more mistakes without mentors, friends in the business. So just like you said, if you show up all the time, you're going to be way ahead of the curve of everyone staying back. And, you know, you'll figure out your way into it. But that's definitely one of the biggest things. Serena, I really appreciate your time. I'm glad that we got this on the schedule. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks so much, Jonathan, for having me. Appreciate it. All right. That was Serena Norris. I'm Jonathan Green. We'll see you next episode. Wait. You have reached the end of the show. This is the part where you're gonna get ready to check out, but I've actually changed this part. For over 120 episodes, you heard the same thing. Well, now I've changed it. I've thought about doing intros to the next episode, but I'm gonna hold off on that for now. These are my pitches at the end. I've got nothing to sell you at all, but I do wanna remind you that it really would help us if you support the podcast in the right way. All that means is subscribing to the podcast so you get it on Monday and Thursday, writing us a five-star review if you believe that we deserve a five-star review, sharing it with your friends, and being a participant in the Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing community. Soon there's going to be a new website launched. Maybe when you're listening to this, it's already going to be out there. That's where we're going to have collaboration. You're going to be able to see a lot from the guest. It is coming soon. And I just want to tell you from me to you, 
I don't know how I got here over a hundred episodes. I'm so appreciative of you listening to the podcast and especially sticking around to hear this part. We'll see you next episode. Thank you.